In the season finale, Melanie hops on the mic and makes a speech about choices, like the choice about climate change and her choice to pirate Snowpiercer and lie to everybody. And she's also making the choice to give up the train to the rebel forces, and then she leaves Leighton to address the train, where he introduces himself. After this initial announcement, Leighton goes to find Miles and explains what happened to Josie, and Miles is very shook up about it. He's crying, and Leighton tries to console him, saying how much that Josie loved him and loved Leighton and loved all the tailies, and they'll get through this together. He then goes to address First Class, who are having their issues, and Leighton announces that the brakemen, along with some rebels, will handle order in the train for the moment until they can vote on a governing body. But most of the first class is concerned because of looting. And while Leighton says, yes, there has been looting, we have it under control at this time. And as you'd expect, there's a lot of infighting between the first class passengers and the third class slash Taylor group on who's to blame for all of this. And it's kind of led by Ruth, who is disgusted at what's going on in Snowpiercer. But Leighton says, we look to ourselves now. We're not putting anybody in any drawers. We're not taking arms. This is on us. He then tells them that you all are department heads and passenger reps. So the message is clear to all of you guys. The train is ours now. It's everybody's. And it's ironic because they're about to pass through Chicago where all of this started. And it's through Chicago where they'll kick off a new revolution. But Ruth isn't buying this and tells Roach as much, saying that a utopian society is never going to work on Snowpiercer. Now, one person who sees that looting firsthand is LJ, who walks into her first-class cabin to find Pike, Terrence, and a bunch of other third-class slash tailies that she doesn't know. And she is scared and crying and begs them to leave, but Terrence says, well, if you see somebody you like, just take their dick. She ends up trying to get them to turn on Pike by saying that he sold her out, but he ends up getting annoyed about that and throwing her out of her own cabin. She ends up finding her way to third class and becoming friends with another outcast, Osweiler. Now, LJ isn't the only one getting used to her new role because Leighton is another person dealing with his new role, but it's not just as the front of the train, it's as dad. He goes and talks to Zara, and Zara is convinced that their baby is going to be a girl, but she's concerned that they won't ever be able to get over the whole Josie situation, and Leighton says, look, our family is never going to be as picture perfect as we thought, but we will make this work. And then there's Melanie, who is about to hunker down in the engine room, has decided that she's been putting off getting a therapy session at the night car for far too long. So she heads to the night car and does that therapy session with Miss Audrey, and it all focuses on her daughter and how upset she is that she put work first, she neglected her family, and she left her daughter on the platform to die and she would give anything to hold her daughter again. After her therapy session, she heads to hospitality to have a conversation with Ruth, who still hasn't forgiven her for what she's done. And she has a whole new issue with being mad at her because of the fact that she's left the train the way it is to go hunker down in the engine. And Ruth kind of has a point. Snowpiercer is hurting at the moment. They're very understaffed, and they need leadership, and Ruth just doesn't think that Leighton is the person to do so. Melanie reminds her that democracy used to work, and sometimes you have to lose something to find it again. But Ruth can't accept that and can't get over the fact that she just killed all of those people, many of whom were Ruth's friends, including Commander Gray. It seems like this relationship can't be fixed, so Melanie says, I'll see you around, Ruth, and Ruth says... I think we've already said our goodbyes. And then she slams the door on her. So that seems to be one breakup. Another is Till and Jinju. Jinju is explaining to both Roach and Till how their crops are decimated by the looters. And now they're demanding that everybody get an equal share of calories, which is close to impossible. Because they're completely understaffed and have been working about 48 hours without sleep at this point. This morphs into a fight between Jinju and Till about the fact that Jinju didn't tell her about the Mr. Wilford situation. And the fight comes to a crescendo when Jinju says, well, I guess we're in agreement now. The train is all that matters. And they seem to break up amicably. Now we'll move to the front of the train where Javi has been fixated on this music that's coming through that radio frequency they rarely use. Then it brushes it off as nothing, but he sees something on the satellite feed and decides it's best to turn that feed off and act like it's not working. But he can't brush it off forever because when Melanie arrives, the first thing that Javi brings up is the music going on, and the first thought that she has is, oh my god, there might be survivors out there. She has to see the satellite, but that's gone. The directional antenna has also been cut by Bennett, who is claiming that he's trying to get everything back on board. So they're having trouble triangulating exactly where the signal is coming from, but they know that they're getting closer to it because the signal is getting stronger. And they also know that if they don't slow down, they're going to miss it. So she says, I got to get Leighton up here. But Bennett says, you don't need Leighton. Come on. She says, no, I do, because we're ushering in a new era and I need his approval on this. So Melanie was dead serious about handing the train over to Leighton. And Leighton at the moment is in the third class dining hall dealing with an issue after Roach caught a couple of tailies stealing a cart of lettuce. Leighton says, come on, where were you taking the lettuce? And they admit that they were taking it up to first class where Pike is. So now Leighton has that issue to deal with. But he has to abandon that situation when he's called to the engine. And when he gets there, Melanie fills him in on all the details. He asks if it's even possible that there are survivors, and she says, I mean, maybe. It's been six years since we've gotten a hit on this thing. 
but they don't use it very often. All the while, Bennett keeps pushing it off like it's nothing. Melanie, though, knowing it's something, lays out the two scenarios for Layton. The first is that they can take speed off, but if they do that, they'll be in deficit. They're going to be using more power than they can actually generate. They're already near emergency reserves, and they're planning on slowing down near Chicago. The other scenario is they race past the signal without pinpointing it, and if they do that, it's going to be a whole other revolution before they're coming back to it. Layton says if there's any possibility that there are other survivors out there and we're not alone, then it's our duty to make contact, and Melanie agrees. So they order the train to slow down. So they slow the train down, and they're able to locate where that signal was coming from, and it's coming from a completely other train and that other train is set to meet them at a junction point melanie feeling like this is mr wilfred is now worried that they're going to be boarded by this other train and the math says they're not going to be able to outrun this train she tells layton if wilfred boards us it's going to be worse than whatever we just went through the past couple days so layton says okay well then i'll get some guys down training the tail to make sure that doesn't happen before he leaves though melanie warns him that if he is able to get on the train the cars are going to be divided and boy is that ever true because while melanie is worried about mr wilfred's return ruth who is in first class is ready to roll out the red carpet. As Layton is making his way down to the tail, he picks up Pike from first class, kicks him out, and brings him back to the tail to fight off any Wilfred intruders. While Layton makes his way towards the tail, Melanie is using every ounce of power that she has to try to outrun Mr. Wilfred's train. But it's not enough, as the second train is able to get a hold of Snowpiercer. It also tries to hack the train to slow the engine down, and Melanie knows that there's only one way to stop the train from being hacked, and that's to go outside on the top of the train and cut the uplink, which is extremely extremely dangerous. Melanie and Bennett go to put their suits on to head outside, and Melanie asks Javi to keep Mr. Wilford at bay as long as he can. Right before Melanie is actually to go outside, though, to cut the uplink, Bennett makes a plea to her not to do it, because in his opinion, they need that supply train. Snowpiercer is quickly falling apart, and they need everything on that other train. But Melanie says, how do you know that any of the things that you're saying are on that train are actually on that train? And more importantly, what is Mr. Wilford going to want? She then accuses him of knowing the entire time that they were going to run into Mr. Wilford's train, and he admits that, yeah, he saw it on the satellite feed and killed it because he thinks it's best for the train. So since he made that decision by himself, she makes a decision by herself and cuts his hose so he can't go out. And then she heads out by herself to cut the uplink. But right before she does so, she tells him that whether she dies or not, he will keep Snowpiercer going one way or the other. So as Melanie heads out in the freeze on the moving train, she's too late. Mr. Wilford is able to stop the engines and Melanie ends up flying off the train into the snow. Layton, who is in the tail, is waiting with the rest of the tailies for Mr. Wilfred to get through the steel door when Ruth shows up with literally a welcome committee of children. They tell Ruth to get out of there, but she ends up pulling a gun on them, claiming how she's hospitality and it's her job. And while this might be Layton's democratic experiment, she is the head of hospitality and she will be there to greet Mr. Wilford upon his return. So Layton orders everybody to put their weapons down and tells Ruth that she will be at the front of the train along with Layton side by side when Mr. Wilford arrives. And she likes this idea and ends up handing over the gun. But when the door opens up, it's not Mr. Wilfred. It's a girl. She announces to everybody that Mr. Wilfred has overtaken their engine and they have 13 minutes until the cold overtakes them. So they need to decide whether or not to peacefully surrender. Layton says that they need to see Mr. Wilfred face to face, but the girl says, is Melanie Cavill here? And since the tale is unaware that Melanie Cavill has actually been thrown from the train and is outside of it, they say, yeah, she's alive. Why? Who are you? And that's when she reveals that she is Alexandra Cavill. She's Melanie's daughter. And she wants to see her mother, who unfortunately is outside of the train with no real hope of getting back inside. And that is how season one of Snowpiercer ends. So thank you so much for watching this video. Please consider subscribing to the channel. Like the video if you liked it. Thumbs down if you don't. If you know somebody that needs a recap of Snowpiercer, please consider sharing the video. And if you want to hear my thoughts on things, Check out my podcast, Scene Invaders. Oh, and I don't read the comments because most of the time they're nasty comments. So if you said something nice and I don't respond, don't take it personally. Just know, though, I do appreciate everybody checking out the video.